Hello, good day. Drew here. And this is a video response to the economics junkie and his his contribution to the debate about Hoover, the Great Depression in the 1930s, and this pretentious debate between the Keynesians and the Austrian school over economics, which I find to be kind of ludicrous on both sides. But as a response, I'll read a speech by Joseph Heffernan, who was the mayor of Youngstown, Ohio, back during the Hoover years. In December 1929, when I was mayor of Youngstown, I attended a conference on unemployment at Cleveland, called at the request of President Hoover. It was held at the Chamber of Commerce under the chairmanship of Mr. Elroy J. Coolis, president of the Otis Steel Company, and was attended by public officials of Northern Ohio. Speaker after speaker told what his community would do to end the Depression, how quickly it would be done. The unemployed were to be sent marching gaily back to work without an instant's delay, and the two-car garage was to be made ready for further enlargement. When it came my turn to speak, I said rather brutally, This is all plain bunk. We know that our cities and counties are in debt and have bond limitations imposed by the state. If all of us were to start this minute of drawing up a program of public improvements, it would require months to get the legislation through. Why not tell people the truth? After the meeting, many of the officials said to me, Mayor, you're right. There isn't much we can do, but we have to go along, don't we? Five months later, I went to Germany and visited a number of cities. Everywhere, I saw that the German people were in a bad way. On returning home, I made a public statement that Germany was on the verge of economic collapse and predicted that the Depression would take five years to run its course. Thereupon, I asked for a bond issue of $1 million for unemployment relief. Many leading businessmen went out of their way to show their disapproval. One of them voiced his, the opinion of the majority when he said to me, You make a bad mistake in talking about the unemployed. Don't emphasize hard times, and everything will be all right. An influential newspaper chastised me for borrowing trouble. The depression would be over, the editor maintained, before relief would be needed. Discussion dragged on for several months, and the gravity of the, of the situation was so deliberately misrepresented by the entire business community that when the bond issue finally came to a ballot in November 1930, it was voted down. Thus, we passed into the early days of 1931, 14 months after the first collapse, with no relief in sight except that which was provided by the Orthodox Charities. Not a single move had been made looking toward action by a united community. Strange as it may seem, there was no way in which city government could embark upon a program of its own. We had no funds available for emergency relief, and without specific authorization from the people, we couldn't issue bonds. To get around that obstacle, we urged the state legislature to amend the law so as to modify our bond limitation but that body was reluctant to pass a relief bill. Finally, after a long delay, it agreed upon a halfway measure which permitted the cities to sell bonds for the limited purpose of providing for their indigents. Made no pretense of supplying new employment for the jobless, but it furthered this end to some degree by indirection. Up to this time, all funds for poor relief had been appropriated from a general receipt such as taxes. The new bonds removed this strain upon taxes, so that the money which had formerly been set aside for that purpose was released for public works. A few of the unemployed were thus given part-time jobs improving the parks. Inadequate as it was, this legislative relief was all that the great state of Ohio could bring itself to grant, and even this pittance was withheld until the crisis had already run through more than 18 devastating months. 
I've cited these instances from my experience as mayor of an industrial city because they illustrate perfectly the state of mind which has been America's greatest handicap in dealing with the Depression. Everyone will remember the assurances that were freely given out in November and December 1929 by the highest authorities in government and business. The country, we were told, was fundamentally sound. Nevertheless, general unemployment continued to increase through the winter. Then in the spring of 1930, it was predicted that we might expect an upward turn any minute. Yet the summer slid by with no hope, with hope unfulfilled. Winter came again, and conditions had grown steadily worse. Still nothing was done, because we were reluctant to face the truth. Our leaders, having made a bad guess in the beginning, had been unwilling to admit their error. With the foolish consistency which is the hobgoblin of little minds, they have persistently rejected reality and allowed our people to suffer by pretending that all would be well on the morrow. In spite of the insurmountable handicaps under which the cities have labored in trying to cope with the emergency, desperate men and women out of work have stormed city halls from coast to coast demanding jobs. It's been a waste of breath for mayors to explain they have no authority to put men to work when the municipal treasuries are empty. Don't hand us that, is a response I've heard over and over again. Do you mean to tell us that the city couldn't raise money if it wanted to? This, of course, has been the real tragedy of the situation. The cities could not raise the money. One man I had known for years stood at my desk and calmly said, My wife is frantic. After working at the steel mill for 25 years, I've lost my job. I'm too old to get other work. If you can't do something for me, I'm going to kill myself. I knew he was desperate. Through friends, I managed to find him a little job where he could earn enough to keep body and soul together. In another instance, a newspaper man urged me to find work for one of his neighbors, a man who had a wife and four sons, all rugged citizens who preferred to starve rather than accept public charity. You could hardly believe what they live on, the reporter told me. Mother mixes a little flour and water and cooks it in a frying pan. That's their regular meal. Eventually, he found work for one of the sons, and he became the sole support of the others. To my home came a sad-eyed woman, mother of nine children. No one in the family had work in more than a year. How do you manage to live, I asked her. I can't tell you, she said. I really don't know. Christmas 1930 was marked with the usual campaigns for the most needy cases and this family was included in the list. They got their Christmas basket all right, but when the holidays were over, they were no better off than they had been before. As time went on, business conditions showed no improvement. Every night, hundreds of homeless men crowded into the municipal incinerator where they found warmth even though they had to sleep on heaps of garbage. In January 1931, I obtained the cooperation of the city council to convert an abandoned police station into a flop house. The first night it was filled, and remained filled ever since. I could make a point of paying frequent visits to this establishment so that I could see for myself what kind of men these down and outers were, and I heartily wish that those folk who have made themselves comfortable by ignoring and denying the suffering of their less fortunate neighbors could see some of the sights I saw. There were old men gnarled by heavy labor, Young mechanics tasting the first bitterness of defeat. Clerks and white-collar workers learning the equality of misery. Derelicts who fared no worse in bad times than in good. Negroes who only a short time before had come from southern cotton fields, now glad to find any shelter from the cold. Immigrants who had been learned of Van Dyke's land of youth and freedom. Each one a personal tragedy. Altogether an overwhelming catastrophe for the nation. In the autumn of 1931, a final blow laid the city of Youngstown prostate. The atmosphere was poisoned with a new fever of apprehension, with rumors that began new, no one knows where, and ended in panic. Have you heard? Everyone whispered excitedly. 
the banks. Pass, 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 pass. The banks. People who were fortunate enough to have money deposited hurried to withdraw it. Day after day, the drain continued, and the bankers had to stand by helplessly while their reserves melted away. The three of the banks closed their well, then three of the banks closed the doors, and fear ran riot. At once, concerted efforts were made to protect other banks. Depositors were besought not to withdraw their savings and were urged to bring back what they had carried away to hide. Statements calling upon the people to have confidence were issued by everyone of supposed influence. The ministers joined the campaign with sermons on civic faith and hope. But confidence was shattered. Had not everyone in authority from the president down been making optimistic statements for two years? And had not subsequent events disapproved all predictions? Could anybody be trusted to tell the truth? Did anybody really know? People stood on the street corners asking each other anxious questions. Never before had the, all the old landmarks of security been so shattered. Never had Youngstown suffered such a shock to the spirit which had made it one of the great industrial centers of the world. Nobody could now deny that America was in the throes of a panic. Another winter was approaching. The numbers of the unemployed had increased, and suffering had grown acute. Many heads of families had not earned a penny in two years. Landlords clamored for their rents and sought evictions. Communists prost protested loudly and threatened to use force to put back anyone who was dispossessed. Thousands of the city's water bills were unpaid, and officials were torn between their desire to be charitable, their fear of disease if the water were cut off, and the city's urgent need of money. Property owners could not pay their taxes, and delinquencies became appalling. Such a large proportion of taxes were uncollectible that the city and county governments had to face the certainty that unless something was done, they would soon lack funds to operate. Wild clamor went up to reduce public expenditures. A year before, cried Ben to keep men at work. The budget for 1932 would have to be cut 40%. This meant that innumerable men who had been saved from, uh, from starvation by doing part-time work would have to be turned away to join the ranks of the wholly unemployed. In consideration of this dilemma, a special one mil tax Levy for relief was finally voted at the November election, but it was apparent that the returns from this source would have to be substantially discounted because of the tax delinquencies. As in Cleveland, we adopt the slogan, pay your taxes so the hungry can be fed, and the words meant just what they said, for by this time the private charities were swamped, desperate, and bankrupt. Such was the state of affairs in Youngstown as we turned the corner of the new year, and it's common knowledge that many another once thriving community now finds itself in the same predicament. What 1932 may do to alter these conditions, no one can say. But perhaps we should take cold comfort in the thought that, no matter what turn events may take, they're bound to induce change for the better, since it is hardly conceivable that the situation can grow much worse than it already is. Often, if I have watched the line of job seekers at City Hall, I've had the occasion to marvel at the mysterious power that certain words and phrases exercise upon the human mind. A wise man once observed that words rule mankind. And so it is in America today. Prominent politicians and businessmen have repeatedly stated that Come what may, America must not have the dole. To be sure, we should all be much happier if we could get along without the dole. But the simple truth is, we have it already. Every city in the land has, had a, has a dole from the moment it began unemployment relief. The men who apply for help know that it's a dole. The officials who issue work orders can be no doubt about it. For the work done in no way justifies the money spent, except on the basis of a dole. Why then so much concern about the word? Perhaps because if we were honest enough to recognize unemployment relief for the dole it really is, we should also have to be honest enough to admit 
that the Depression is a catastrophe of historic proportions and courageous enough to deal with it accordingly. One alternative to the dull would be to let all the unfortunates starve to death, but so far no one has advanced this proposal. Although some have come pretty close to it, or close to it in saying that the way out of the Depression is to let nature take its course. Those who have not been willing to go so far as that have maintained, however, that each community must look after its own unemployed, and that under no circumstances must the federal government assume any responsibility for them. For two years, local communities have carried the burden unassisted, and many of them, like Youngstown, have prostrated themselves in doing it. We of the cities have done our best, laboring under con against conditions which were beyond our control. But even if we are given full credit for trying, we must now admit we have failed miserably. Whether this was caused by lack of simple charity in the hearts of our people or by our incapacity to manage our financial problems is beside the point. The fact of our failure is patent. We of the cities have not advanced a single new idea on unemployment or its relief. We've not dared to consider the fundamental questions raised by our social and economic collapse. We are still as stupidly devoted as ever to the philosophy of laissez-faire, and we face the future bewildered and purposeless. Our one great achievement in response to this national catastrophe has been to open soup kitchens and flop houses. And nobody has taken the trouble to weigh the consequences of our well-meant but ineffective charity upon the moral fiber of the American people. Seven years ago, we fought a civil war to free black slaves. Today, we remain indifferent while millions of our fellow citizens are reduced to the status of paupers. There's a world of difference between mere pauper, poverty, and pauperism. The honest poor will struggle for years to keep themselves above the pauper class. With quiet desperation, they will bear hunger and mental anguish until every resource is exhausted. Then comes the ultimate struggle when, with heartache and overwhelming sense of disgrace, they have to make the shame-faced journey to the door of public charity. This is the last straw. Their self-respect is destroyed. They undergo an insidious metamorphosis and sink down to spiritless despondency. This descent from respectability, frequent enough in the best of times, has been hastened immeasurably by two years of business paralysis. And the people who have been affected in this manner must be numbered in millions. This is what we have accomplished with our bread lines and soup kitchens. I know, because I have seen thousands of these defeated, discouraged, Hopeless men and women, cringing and fawning as they come to ask for public aid. It's a spectacle of national degeneration. That is the fundamental tragedy for America. If every mill and factory in the land should begin to hum with prosperity tomorrow morning, the destructive effect of our haphazard relief measures would not work itself out of the nation's blood until the sons of our sons have expiated the sins of our neglect. Okay. And that was something from 1932, I guess, from Mayor Joseph Heffernan of Youngstown, Ohio, describing the conditions he faced then. And in a sense, that's, that's much better than this academic debate that goes on between these Keynesians and these Austrian school fanatics because either side are wrong but that's that's for another video I've gone quite a long while on that but it's just something uh, that should be said because it's a voice from when it was happening okay this is Drew thank you for listening bye bye